Hey everyone, my name is Sean Faulkner and I am head of developer relations and marketing at Skyflow. And this is an API based approach to data protection and data residency for LLMs. So unless you've been living under a rock essentially for the last year, LLMs is the new, new thing. It's, it's pretty much what dominates every conversation I've had about technology in the last six months. It's, it's what dominates my, my Twitter or X feed. It's what everybody's kind of you know talking about and is interested in at this point. And in fact, like a few months ago, I traveled back to my hometown. I'm from a very small place in Eastern Canada. You know, basically you walk 20 minutes in any direction and you're in the middle of the woods. And when my father, who's a man in his mid seventies and has been retired for over the over a decade and never worked in technology, when he picked me up at the airport, one of the first things he said to me was, is AI going to take people's jobs? So you know when AI, LLMs, generative AI, ChatGPT are essentially a topic of conversation for the retirement community of rural Eastern Canada, this is something that is on essentially everyone's mind. Now, despite that, all the hype around this and all the interest, you know, it's hard to sometimes sort of disambiguate from what is real versus what is, you know, maybe a falsehood or fake. So I think it's important to take a step back and, you know, dive into what does all this really mean for our industry before we get into some of the problems with essentially where we stand in the world of generative AI today. And I think one way to really understand what this might mean for our industry is take a look back at some of the other historical innovations that have happened. You know, every decade or so for the last 50 years, there's been a major technology shift that's happened that has changed the way that essentially consumers interact with technology, going back to mainframes in the 1970s, to desktop computing in the 80s, internet in the 90s, mobile after that, and so forth. So by looking at some of these trends and some of the, the impact that these different paradigm shifts had, I think you can tell us a little bit about what maybe LLMs have in store for us. So starting with the internet era, so this is kind of mid to late 90s, you know, this is a quote I pulled from that era, which was that we were promised instant shopping, we'll order airline tickets over the network, make restaurant reservations, stores will become obsolete. So how come my local mall does more business in an afternoon than the entire internet handles in a month? So clearly this person was very wrong. Now, that being said, it did take us a little longer to essentially achieve this vision where we do have instant shopping. We, you know, I booked my airline ticket to the conference uh, for API days using um, the internet. I make res restaurant reservations online. All these things happened, it took a little while to get there. And I was very fortunate to be in high school when this happened. And as I mentioned, I grew up in a you know small place in rural Canada. So being able to go from essentially this like disconnected world of the Dewey Decimal System to suddenly being able to be connected and talk to people all over the world was a really amazing experience for me. And it changed, of course, the course of my life because I went on to study computer science. I got really obsessed with the internet and computing, and it's led me to talking to you today. The internet era also had a major impact in terms of the way we do business. And if you weren't part of essentially becoming an internet first company, or you were an internet first company, you essentially ceased to exist, or you became a dinosaur that everyone kind of forgot about. So you had to essentially adapt your business or change your business to this change in technology. Now, fast forward a decade, and we entered the mobile era. And people said, people maybe will browse on these things, but nobody will buy. I'm willing to bet that anybody that's listening to me talk right now has probably purchased something on their smartphone. And so clearly, you know, this person was very wrong. And I was fortunate to have founded a company actually during the mobile era. And the company was a two-sided marketplace where we essentially had job seekers that were looking for jobs and we had people who were hiring. And we were the first company to ever create that entire end-to-end -end hiring experience using a mobile device. And all the incumbents at the time that dominated the industry thought that, it was crazy to essentially invest in mobile because why would anyone ever apply for a job using a mobile device when they're in front of a computer all day? But what we knew and what we saw was that the next generation of internet users, people who are just entering essentially the workforce, their main way of interacting with the world was through a mobile device. So they were already applying the jobs using a mobile device just in you know very convoluted ways. And all we did was essentially make that 
much, much simpler. And all the companies that jumped into the mobile era and became mobile first companies essentially ate up the market and left the companies that weren't able to adapt in the dust. Now, in 2012, 2013, we entered the cloud era. And it wasn't so much that people didn't see value in a lot of the horizontal and vertical scalability that the cloud had provided in this idea of essentially sort of pay for play that Amazon introduced in, uh, when they came out with AWS services. But a lot of people thought, we don't need to essentially rely on the AWS, the Salesforce, the service nows of the world. We're going to go ahead and build our own cloud. We don't trust what those companies are doing, or maybe we don't trust the security of what they're doing. So they, all these companies invested in their own cloud. And you know where are they now? Most of those companies either died or they had to change the way and essentially adapt to the cloud era and finally move to services like AWS and so forth. And in fact, even banks like JP Morgan, Chase in the United States, one of the largest banks in the world, this article is from 2017, but essentially they came out and they said, hey, look, this public cloud thing, it's got some real legs. We're going to actually start to migrate to it. And they've been in essentially a multi-year journey of migrating over to the public cloud. So even when banks are recognizing the value of the public cloud, as well as trusting that the public cloud is secure, you know that essentially all businesses are sort of moving in that direction. So what does all this mean in terms of the LLM era? Well, right now, we have things like ChatGPT, GitHub Copilot. ChatGPT just had its first year birth, uh, anniversary. Happy birthday, ChatGPT. It's pretty amazing. Um, it's hard to believe it's only been around for 12 months. But ChatGPT really has, I think, brought AI, LLMs to people like my parents. It's, it's essentially created a new way of interacting with technology. And in fact, I talked to the CTO of Algolia recently. And one of the things that he said was that they're actually seeing a change in behavior in terms of how people are searching. Because now people are actually entering longer queries into search boxes because we're ch our expectation about how technologies can interact with us is changing. For the last 20 years, we've sort of programmed ourselves into entering essentially things that work really well for traditional information retrieval systems like Google uses, where we you know, want to put in a few short terms that we know are going to lead to a satisfying response. But now we can actually interact with technology like we would interact with a person and even get a response that feels human-like. And that is changing the way that we essentially interact with these things. And of course, ChatGPT went to grew to a million users in the first five days. Now is well over 100 million users did it in the first, I think, five months. It's not even hockey stick graph. It's basically a 90 degree right angle in terms of the growth. And according to this Forbes article, the AI market is believed to be worth about $407 billion by 2027. Probably underestimate, to be honest. But there's clearly a lot of stuff going on here. And a lot of companies that have been around for a long time, like IBM, are rushing to essentially prove that they are an AI company and that they can adapt to what's going on right now. Even companies like Notion has their, you know, Notion AI, all these different companies essentially introducing some form of AI. And a lot of people are scrambling to try to show and prove that they're still relevant. So we're essentially in this place like companies were in the late 90s with the internet or in the, you know, late aughts with the introduction of essentially the, the first smartphones. But we all got to move or we're going to be left behind. Now, the good news is that we're all kind of starting from the same place. It doesn't matter whether you're a big enterprise or you're a startup. It's not like you had some existing, pre-existing AI investment, or most likely you didn't. It's some existing you know, LLM stack. We're all investing in these technologies for the first time and trying to figure it out all together. Now, while there's all this momentum going on, and it's all very exciting, and I'm certainly excited about it, we do have a major problem just like we have when we introduce any kind of new technology. But the big challenge that we have when it comes to AI models is it's a real fundamental shift in the way that we think about essentially the storage and interaction of, with data. And essentially, unlike databases that have been essentially commercially available since the 1970s, AI models don't have a delete button. There's no row to go and delete information. 
So what does this mean in the context of essentially privacy? Well, it means that if you use customer or employee data or even core intellectual property to train a model or you share that information during inference, there's no way to get it back. Essentially, once the model has it, you can't really delete it without blowing away the model, which is you know, not a very cost-effective way to remove it. So that is a big problem in the world in the world of GDPR and things like the right to be forgotten and things like data residency, because we have no real way to essentially comply with the hundred plus privacy regulations that exist around the world. And as a response to this, you know, Italy became the first westernized country to ban ChatGPT. Uh, they subsequently really, you know, relinquished the ban or removed the ban after OpenAI made some changes, but there was concern essentially over um, whether they were compliant with GDPR. Similarly, on the company side, companies like Apple, Goldman Sachs, Samsung, and you know, hosts of other companies have gone through different phases of essentially banning ChatGPT and GitHub Copilot and other LLM or chat, uh, generative AI systems. And even just a couple of weeks ago, researchers at Google were actually able to uh, manipulate through prompts ChatGPT to essentially get out core PII that was used during training. So there's a lot of problems and a lot of concern, but essentially banning these systems isn't really a long-term solution. It's a Band-Aid at best because there's a lot of value to these technologies and clearly employees want to take advantage of it. And simply you know, banning the URL doesn't stop people from going around those systems to uh, driving the value from the technology. So we need to figure out a way to safely use these technologies without essentially leaking core IP and PII. Now, while all of this is going on, there's also been this convergence of AI architectures happening. So earlier this year, Andreessen Horowitz um, published a blog post about the emerging LLM app stack. And I've seen a couple similar posts from other VC firms as well. And I highly recommend taking a look at this article, but they broke down essentially this LLM app stack that's being developed. And you can see through essentially the life cycle of data at each area, there's companies that exist that are sort of attacking those different problem areas. So there's data pipelines, embedding models, vector databases, and so forth. Data flows through an orchestration layer. Eventually you create some form of LLM or augment an LLM or fine tune an LLM. And then you're essentially allowing people to consume it through some version of an API. But what's missing from all these different core components is anything about privacy and security. And that's a big problem for the reasons I mentioned. Now, back in June, Salesforce attempted to address this by launching what they call the Einstein, the Einstein GPT trust layer. And their idea was, let's put in this secure gateway that essentially controls access to these hosted models within Salesforce trust boundary. Now, I think this is the moving things in the right direction. And they're you know, clearly thinking deep about this. But the problem here, of course, is that this is specific to Salesforce. It doesn't really help you if you're trying to leverage models on open AI or you're taking advantage of open source models or you know, like Llama 2 or something like that. It doesn't really help solve that problem. Now, the various cloud providers like Google, Snowflake, AWS, Microsoft, and so forth, what they're saying is <clears throat> come build your model in a single independent environment and run it within our infrastructure where only you have access, essentially private LLM. So Google came out with an architectural diagram uh, showing how this would work. AWS came out with similar architectures. All the essentially cloud providers have come out with something similar. But this is kind of taking us back to the missteps that we made in the early days of the cloud where people said, hey, I'm not gonna trust the cloud. I'm gonna essentially build my own cloud architecture or my own cloud systems. And we see where that got us. So what these companies are saying, don't trust the open source models, come build your own foundation models, create a walled garden within our infrastructure. And besides that being self-serving, it doesn't really solve the fundamental problem of privacy because what private LLM gives you is model isolation. It doesn't give you privacy or fine grained access control. Because ultimately, privacy is really about transparency for what you're doing with the data, as well as giving people control over the data that you are essentially storing about them. 
So what really matters in the world of privacy is who sees what, when, where, and for how long. A private LLM does not solve this problem. What we need to be able to do is if we're training an LLM on company data or employee data or customer data, we need to make sure that Susie in accounting sees one version of responses while Bob in marketing sees something else. And maybe, you know, Sally, the CEO, sees some other version of this information. So controlling who sees what, when, and where for how long. Now, while all of this has been going on, over the last few years, we've started to finally recognize that not all data is the same. And we've developed specific types of technology that help us essentially securely store and use certain types of information. So for encryption keys, we've developed KMS, our key management systems. Secrets, we have secrets managers. Passwords, we have things like identity cloud, so we can offload essentially identity and the management of passwords to, to products like Okta, for example. But we don't really have anything that satisfies sensitive PII data. What we've historically done is we've taken PII data and we've essentially treated it as the same as all other types of application and transactional data, stored it in a database, maybe sprinkled on some encryption, crossed our fingers and hoped it was secure. Now, fortunately, there has been some, some innovators in this space. So last year, the IEEE came out with an article about the future of privacy engineering. And in that article, they said that we need to move beyond privacy by design to this world of privacy by engineering by introducing this new architecture of essentially the data privacy vault. And this concept of data privacy vault was originally pioneered by companies like Google, Netflix, Apple, and a handful of others. And the idea is that we need to treat PII as something special, just like we treat encryption keys as something special move it out of the existing systems and store it within a data privacy vault that's specifically designed to isolate, protect, and govern access to PII data. So that is the IEEE's recommendation. It's also how a lot of the leading technology companies in the world are essentially solving this problem. So it's helping fill in this gap of essentially the categorization of different types of data. So now the zero trust PII data privacy vault is becoming essentially the industry standard for which we use to store and manage PII data. And what the vault gives you essentially is a way to de-scope your systems from the responsibilities of data privacy, security, data residency, and so forth, because all you're essentially operating on is de-identified forms of data. And then you leverage the vault to essentially control access to the information, giving you fine-grained access control, essentially solving that problem of who sees what, when, and where for how long. So what we want to be able to do is essentially take the best of privacy by engineering and combine it with this world of generative AI to help us solve as this essentially this trust and privacy problem for customers and businesses. So when we talk about leakage of PII into an LLM, there's essentially two places this can happen. The first is model training. So this doesn't matter whether you're building a foundation model, you're fine tuning, or you're augmenting a model. Essentially, you're gonna start out with a bunch of sensitive and non-sensitive data in some data source. And these are just examples. And what you wanna do as you start your LLM training pipeline is you wanna have that data first go into your data privacy vault, where the vault essentially takes this unstructured data, detects the sensitive data, stores it within the vault, and replaces it with de-identified forms of data, creating essentially a clean data source that is, has referential integrity and essentially enough context to be relevant for the LLM. And now the clean data is essentially going to go into your model training environment. So your model training still continues as normal, but now you're training against this clean data because the model doesn't really care that it sees something like my name, Sean Falconer, in the as a string. What it really needs is some sort of representation of my name. So it could be, you know, ABC123. It just needs to understand that's the name. And eventually this is all vectorized data anyway. So it doesn't need actually the raw string. So what we're doing is essentially using the vault like a privacy firewall to prevent any PII from essentially entering the model training environment. Now, the other place that we could essentially have PII share is through model inference. So here I'm asking the model to uh, summarize a will. Clearly there's sensitive data here. We want that information to go through the vault initially to detect the sensitive data, replace it with de-identifiers, and create a clean version of the prompt that we're going to pass to the LLM. Then when we receive the response, 
We're going to have that go back through the data privacy vault. We're going to apply the fine grain access control policies that we have in place and re-identify any of the de-identified forms of data, making sure that the person who put in the prompt is actually allowed to see that information. So again, we're buffering the model from ever seeing any of the sensitive data. All right, so let's go ahead and see some of this in action. So what I have here is a demo I built for a medical health customer support scenario. So we have a medical health uh, system where a patient is conversing with customer support, and then customer support can essentially interact with an AI-based assistant that is behind the scenes, an LLM trained on patient data. So we need to be able to do privacy safe training, privacy safe inference. We need fine-grained access control so that the customer support agent has limited access to the patient records. Oh, so we're going to jump over actually to a live demo here. So here we have, um, you know, patient information. We can see the chat history. And what I'm going to do here is enter a prompt. And I'm going to say, what is the patient's name? And we can also say, what is the patient's uh, date of birth and uh, policy number? So what's happening here is I'm getting back my responses, as I expect. But everything that's in blue is actually the sensitive data that I'm uh, preventing from sharing with the model. And what the model actually sees is this de-identified forms of the data. So we're essentially using the data privacy vault, like a privacy firewall, to prevent the leakage of PII data and then re-identifying it because it essentially has referential integrity on the way back out. So very, very simple uh, uh, a demo here. And then we'll jump back to the slides and kind of dive into how some of this stuff works. So in terms of what this app stack is, pretty uh, straightforward stuff. The front end is Next.js, the back end is Django, and then my LLM stack is Snowflake, OpenAI, and ChromaDB, which is a vector database. And then I'm using Skyflow for the data privacy vault. And for training, what I'm doing is I'm creating a RAG model. So I'm taking a bunch of raw patient data and I'm going to create a bunch of embeddings that we use to attach as context for the prompts that are going to be sent into the model. So I'm taking the raw data. I'm having that go through Skyflow. Skyflow is going to detect and remove sensitive data, create a clean data source free of any identifiers for the patient records. Then we feed that through Snowpipe down into Snowflake and store it in a Snowflake table. Then I'm using Langchain. Langchain has a Snowflake document loader that I'm using to create the vectorized forms of the data and storing that in ChromaDB. So that is the training uh, model, pretty simple. Then in terms of inference, what I'm doing is when I enter something like, who is John Doe, I'm passing that data to Skyflow initially so that I can de-identify any sensitive data. We can do that essentially by calling the detect API endpoint, or in this case, I'm using the Python SDK to call detect. And I'm going to get back clean data that's been de-identified. And then I'm grabbing the embeddings from ChromaDB, using the retrieval QA object from Langchain, and then making a call, first de-identifying the data, getting that clean input, like we saw, attaching the vector store using GPT-35 Turbo and the clean data as the prompt to essentially execute the inference cycle. So no PII is going to be shared with the model during inference. And then on a response, which I'm not showing here, we'd run that back through the Skyflow to re-identify any, any of the de-identified data, apply the fine grain access control policies that are put in place. Pretty simple stuff. So essentially, we just want to make sure that we're not sharing PII with the model at any point. And the key here, as I mentioned, is we never want to send PII into the model because essentially the model never forgets. Models are designed to learn, not unlearn. We can't simply just go delete it. So what we need to do is prevent any sharing of it from the first place. But by combining the best of privacy by engineering in the form of a data privacy vault, we can still leverage LLMs the way that we want and essentially create privacy safe AI. And this allows us to be compliant. We can even solve challenges like data residency because now we can essentially keep the regulated data within the vault stored within or localized within the region that the customer lives in and run a global LLM because the LLM is never ever going to see any of the regulated sensitive data. But it's still, we're still sharing enough context for the LLM to essentially do the work that needs to do. All right, so I want to thank you so much.
there we go. Thank you so much. And uh, if you have any interest or questions about this, you can always reach out to my email there. And if you're interested in this topic and other forms of topics around security and privacy, you can check out a podcast I host called Partially Redacted at skyflow.com slash podcast. But thank you so much.